coming up. The government would have us believe that there's a £55 billion shortfall in the economy due to global factors like the aftermath of the pandemic and Russia's war against Ukraine. The Tory narrative is that these factors have caused a global supply crunch, soaring inflation, energy price rises and rising interest rates and that other countries have been hit just as badly as the UK. Except they haven't. The UK is the only major economy which still hasn't bounced back to its pre-Covid size and our Office for Budget Responsibility forecasts the UK economy to have the sharpest decline amongst all European nations during 2023, mainly due to Brexit. Get over it, the Brexitists say, but what the media are now referring to as regret seems to have increased dramatically of late. Stay tuned. If you enjoy watching the Truth to Power channel, I'd really appreciate it if you'd help me out by hitting the like button and especially by sharing a link to this video on your social media platforms. Earlier this year, John Springford of independent think tank the Centre for European Reform studied the £29 billion package of tax rises announced by the then Chancellor Rishi Sunak. And he found that taxes were up to their highest share of GDP since the 1960s. He added, these tax rises would not have been needed if the UK had stayed in the EU or in the Single Market and Customs Union. Let that sink in. All this talk of sovereignty in it and Brussels bashing and the manufactured and hyped immigration crisis are all minor distractions. UK taxes are measurably at their highest levels in most people's lifetimes and Brexit has been proved to be a major factor. Using the OBR's official estimate that Brexit will reduce the UK's long-term productivity by 4%, John Springford has calculated that around half of the fiscal whole and the political instability that comes with it is down to Brexit. Ian Mulhyan of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change is in broad agreement with that statement, saying that Overall, the net cost of Boris Johnson's Brexit to the public finances will come in at almost £30 billion each year. None of these taxes would have been necessary if we had remained in the EU. And why is that, you may ask? Well, Brexit has three distinct impacts on the UK economy. First, the non-tariff barriers, which have caused a 16% reduction in Britain's international trade, which also hits corporate profits, particularly amongst small and medium-sized companies, and has reduced tax income as a result. Secondly, further government revenue loss has been caused by removal of freedom of movement and lost all of those productive, tax-paying EU citizens who have now returned back home. And thirdly, the UK's EU annual divorce bill of £25 billion. This holy trinity is what Ian Mulhern calls the economic drag anchor of Brexit. The shortfall in the UK's GDP and goods trade performance compared to other advanced economies is down to Brexit, not Covid. Brexit is also having a provable effect on levels of investment within the UK economy and Brexit itself is the main drag on economic growth. Truss's anti-growth alliance is, in reality, those still supporting the failed Brexit experiment. The Brexitists, who tell us that the national xenophobic tantrum of 2016 was actually the unalterable and eternal will of the people, and that it is somehow undemocratic of Remoners to keep banging on about it as if they wouldn't still be banging on about Brexit if the advisory referendum had thrown up a different result. Britain's voluntary exit from the EU's single market and customs union was ridiculous enough in itself, but on top of that, the minimalist and deeply flawed Brexit trade deal negotiated by Boris Johnson and intellectually challenged lightweights like David Frost have brought additional problems. It's ensured a number of trade barriers with established and permanent problems for importers and exporters like customs declarations, rules of origin checks, regulatory controls and health checks. But don't just take my word for it. Chair of the campaign group Save British Farming, Liz Webster, reckons Brexit is tearing the union apart and destroying our largest manufacturing sector food and farming. 
Trade is bound up in so much red tape, it couldn't be worse for us. I'm really concerned for food security, food stocks and food supply. And it's not just food and agriculture. Evidence suggests that the UK's financial sector has been bollocksed by Brexit too, with reports this week that Paris has now overtaken London as Europe's biggest stock exchange. Everywhere you look, every sector of the UK economy is doing worse than similar economies elsewhere. And as the economy shrinks, if you believe that tax revenues should cover public services and welfare expenditure, then you're going to have to raise taxes even higher than the current record post-war levels. And if you want to argue that this is the result of the lockdowns, then remember that the OBR has stuck to its forecast that the damaging effects of Brexit have already been and will continue to be larger than those of Covid. No wonder the Brexitists have had enough of experts. Tony Danker, Director General of the UK's main employers body, the Confederation of British Industry, says, A desperate lack of workers is inflating wages and stopping firms growing since the ending of freedom of movement. Brexitist Lord Simon Wolfson of the next retail chain chimed in last week with, We have to take a different approach to economically productive migration adding, in respect of immigration, it's definitely not the Brexit that I wanted. But remember, they all knew what they were voting for, didn't they? The fact that the UK's inflation rate is higher than its European peers is due to Brexit, with its impact on migration a major factor. No wonder that calls are growing amongst desperate British businesses for the UK to begin the process of rejoining at least the single market, and in many cases the EU itself. Even if any progress towards either goal is likely to take decades and depends on the unlikely kindness of the EU. But it won't even start until we have a Prime Minister or even a leader of the opposition who is at least willing to acknowledge the immense harm that Brexit is doing to the country. Keir Starmer's Make Brexit Work mantra is incredibly frustrating for the majority of British voters who are pro-European. Despite the polling trends showing regret is growing by the day, Starmer shuns any debate about closer ties to the EU. Liz Webster of Save British Farming again. The quick solution is to free up our trade by getting back in the single market as quickly as possible. And this from Jürgen Meyer, Vice Chair of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership and an ex-CEO of Siemens UK. It was the biggest lie of them all that we could replace the economic upside of being part of the most advanced free trade zone in the world. No independent trade deal can replace its economic upside. It is time to face up to this as a country. The trouble is, politicians in both major parties are not facing up to the economic damage being caused by Brexit, and so the underlying problems are not being acknowledged, let alone addressed. When Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, claimed that the UK was looking to remove the vast majority of trade barriers that exist between us and the EU, it sparked panic and threats from the Tory party's Eurosceptics, made worse by the Sunday Times reporting that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak was considering pursuing a closer arrangement with the European Union, modelled on that of Switzerland. As I'm sure viewers of the Truth to Power channel will know, the Swiss have access to the single market and fewer border checks in return for paying into the bloc's coffers, allowing freedom of movement and accepting various other EU rules. Sunak quickly denied the report, saying, Under my leadership, the United Kingdom will not pursue any relationship with Europe that relies on alignment with EU laws. Sunak may only be around for a year or two at most, but under Prime Minister Starmer, it doesn't look like the UK government's approach to Brexit is likely to change anytime soon. And in any case, it's pretty academic, with EU officials making clear that any deal with Brussels without full legal alignment is wishful thinking. They saw this softened approach by Jeremy Hunt as an attempt to gauge the scale of opposition amongst Tory Brexitists, what is known in politics as flying a kite. An EU official briefed the I newspaper it seems more like something aimed at the Tory party's Eurosceptic wing, the European Research Group, rather than at the EU. And there was indeed an immediate backlash from the ERG members who said it would mean a massive surrender of our sovereignty. 
These indications from the government of the softening of their stance on Brexit is leading to members of the ERG getting increasingly paranoid and they're on high alert for a betrayal by the government, even as their numbers are said to have shrunk to around only eight fully paid up swivel eyed lunatics. You have to wonder how much longer they can remain as the tail that wags the dog of Sunak's government. They forced Prime Minister Theresa May to insist that Brexit means Brexit, the most inane of all three-word slogans, until Boris Johnson came along with Get Brexit Done, which was just as meaningless. But both those failed Prime Ministers could hide behind their slogans, for a while at least, because they could promote Brexit as a blow for British sovereignty or as a curb against uncontrolled immigration. But British sovereignty has not been strengthened in any meaningful or measurable way by leaving the EU. Immigration has proved even more out of control now that Brexit meant leaving the Dublin Agreement which allowed the UK to return migrants to the first safe country they entered. So all that's left is the mythical Brexit opportunities for the British economy. Among the group of seven advanced countries, the G7, Britain is the only one with an economy that is smaller now than before the pandemic started. The UK was recently overtaken by India as the world's fifth largest economy. Brexit has been judged on all measures and has been found to be disastrous. Yet neither the Tories nor the Labour Party are offering any serious solutions. I'll be talking more about this tomorrow, 27th of November, on the Sunday Rose channel here on YouTube with my good friends Alex of Political X, Maximilian Robespierre, and another top guest. See you then.